I'm Mark Conklin, N7XY, I'm the Section Emergency Coordinator uh, for the Amateur Radio Emergency Services, which is a program of the ARRL, the National Association of Amateur Radio. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a few things. Why do we have those at the bottom? I love windows sometimes. Yes, I do. Um, Aries, what do we do? Well, amateur radio emergency service, now this is the legal definition, makes all the lawyers happy. Uh, amateur radio emergency service consists of licensed amateurs who voluntarily register their qualifications and equipment with their local areas leadership for communications, duty, and public service. Now, the easiest way to register, how many folks in here actually registered through AriesOK.org? Good. Anybody send in a membership thing or an application directly to the league and you didn't go through AriesOK.org? Outstanding, yeah, because that's where you need to register at AriesOK.org. Oh, I'm good. Why am I missing things? That's better. That's freaking me out. I was like, what is that? Okay, a couple things I'm going to talk about uh, today. Our numbers, Oklahoma's a big place, training, professional image, our approach to emergency communications or public service communications depends on who, who you want to argue with in the room, our role in the world, and how do we fit? Oklahoma's a big place. Anybody ever driven across this state knows it takes more than 30 minutes. Uh, you have a couple of big cities that make up most of Oklahoma. You have the Oklahoma City Metroplex. Um, numbers here are all based on the 2010 sur uh, census. Um, this is gonna, the name's gonna change. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The Tulsa Metropolitan Region and the third MSA that kind of makes up another clump is down towards Lawton. But the majority of Oklahoma's population are in these two MSAs. Whether you believe it or not, Oklahoma is a really rural state. I mean, our, our population runs along the I-44 corridor and the rest of the state. There's some cows, some trees, pretty lakes, but it is a big thing. When you go look at the FCC database, there's 10,000 822 amateurs as of yesterday, licensed in Oklahoma. When you look at ARL statistics, they figure about half of the people that are licensed are actually active amateurs, i.e. they key a mic, touch a key, turn on a radio, actually do something with their license. Because we all know there are some high schools out there, some universities, tech schools, that just, you know, you get five extra points for getting your ham license. There's lots of folks in the public safety world that uh, the emergency manager says, all of my staff will be hams. And about half of them have uh, gotten a license and haven't turned the radio on or know what to do with it. So, you know, they're on there. We're talking about the folks that actually key the radio. Registered with Aries, Oklahoma, 662. That's about 5% of the active amateurs. And it's actually about 5.2, so we're ahead of the national average. But uh, we're, we're a good thing. We've got folks that are actually in the database. And this doesn't include other folks that are amateurs that are involved in emergency communications, uh, the folks that are affiliated with Saturn, the NTS system, REACT, Mars, other groups like that. Oklahoma, when you line up where our membership is in, with the population, we cover roughly 70% of the total citizens in uh, the, the state which is higher than the state's really high dollar 800 system, by the way. But, and I always pick on them. This is, based on the 2010 census, this is how Oklahoma's laid up. The darker the green, the more people there are. You look at Tulsa, Oklahoma County, Comanche County, those are, that, that I-44 runs right down through here. Most of your population's in here. This is the six regions in which Oklahoma is. One difference is Logan County is part of this group in here. We've, we've, after some discussion with the folks in this part of the world, we've actually put Logan County uh, in there because a lot of folks live and work driving right up and down I-35 in there. So they're part of that, that group there. We have changed the regions from numbers, which people couldn't keep track of one to six, I don't know how, to actual physical locations. This is just a title change. This up here, guess what? It, this is called the Northwest region. This one over here is the Northeast region. This down here 
Guess which one? Southeast. You people are sharp. Southwest. This is the Tulsa region. These folks did not want to be called the Oklahoma City region. So they are the capital region. Because people in Edmond didn't want to mention Oklahoma City or the people. Yeah, so uh, it, was, it was a simple thing. Guys come up with a name uh, and capital. So, you know, because we have the capital there. And everybody seemed to be okay with that versus the Oklahoma City region. It's cat herding. But anyway, that's what they are. And that is the, the six regions in Oklahoma. Now what's different, will it come up? No, it didn't come up. Poo. It was there and I tried it three or four times at home. Anyway, a listing of, we used to have 23 districts here in Oklahoma. We now have six districts. We have looked at, I looked at everybody and their brother across the, the country. And, you know, most of our districts were one, two, three counties. And that's kind of nuts, which required an awful lot of extra people that were leaders. And we have changed that to now it is just 12 districts in the state. So one of the things that I have challenged all of the regional leaders, the regional ECs, uh, which we got one sitting over Jay with his red hat on, uh, is to tell them to look at your regions and look at your people and make sure you've got DECs on the districts in your area. Um, you know, which basically means you're going to end up shifting some folks that are already DECs to make sure their counties, they understand which counties are their responsibilities, or some other folks that are ECs, uh, make sure they're there. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Because it's probably here really quick. Uh, new updates. God, no. That'll just take over the dang machine. We'll be here a week waiting for updates. Yeah. There we go. We'll just roll it down. These are the, the uh, districts, and we'll, I'll roll this down, and we can see the rest. Up in the northwest, you, again, you've got two. These are the counties that are in there. The one that is starred is generally the, the uh, largest county, the biggest population center in that part of the world. If you've got a choice or you'd like to find a D DC, you know, probably finding a DEC that lives in that county would be a good thing. It's not necessary, but that's kind of the concentration of where your population is. This is the Northwest, Southwest group, Tulsa, the capital region again, uh, through Logan in there. And then northeast and the southeast. Really looked at where the population is, the road structure, where folks go, uh, you know, to kind of clump these groups together. Some initially didn't seem logical to you kind of talk to the local folks and you find out when we all go shopping, we go to this town. We don't go over here. Those kind of things. We, we looked at how the communities interacted each other to line those up in there. And again, these are the the largest populations, like in this area, you know, Pryor's the biggest town in that part of the world. And that's where your biggest population center is up in there. Um, you know, when you look at this one, Washington's bigger. They've got more folks than Pahuska and all that. So it just kind of lined out that way. Now back to our show. Or did it go away? It doesn't like that Epson. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. Next big challenge that we face is training. This is such a hard thing to get folks to do. Uh, a lot of folks figure, you know, I got my ham license, I know everything I need to know. But when you're dealing with communications, when it's emergency communications or public safety communications, you're interfacing with other folks, understanding their language and how they work is a good thing. There's more to do than just be able to punch that PTT button. You know, you're going to need to know that. And during a deployment or a project is the less than ideal time to try and learn. I mean, we get this group of volunteers every event. They just call me if you need me. I need you now. I need you to register. I need you to understand. I need you to do a little bit of training. So when you do deploy to the field, you're a little bit useful. I was hoping that Mike Rocky would be here or Stan Bradley. They were out of Bridge Creek. And they had a core of folks that showed up that had been to events, done training, and they were fine. There were other folks that showed up with their handy talkie and wanted to help. But really, when you said, OK, I need you to do this, do this kind of documentation, they were lost. So there was a little bit of where you just go, OK, wait over there, and I'll come talk to you. Because uh, it takes a little time to get those folks in the field because they need a little extra training. Think about it. There was more to learn about driving your car after you got your license. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, you, you get your license, even, even in the hobby part of amateur radio, when you first get your license, you know, you got that, maybe a handy talkie, and you're still learning from that point. Well, public safety communications or amateur radio emergency services is kind of the same way. Training, the National Incident Management System. Everybody's heard the words NIMS or ICS. FEMA loves acronyms. FEMA is an acronym but uh, is the standard for managing emergencies and emergency responses, disaster events, reoccurring uh, or you know, requiring coordination of one or more agencies. Every served agency that ARIES volunteers with, works with, helps with, uh, is, adheres to this standard. And so does ARIES. If you look at the new manual, has everybody had a chance to download and read the new manual? Cool. If you haven't seen it, go to ariesok.org, this handy little website. Go over on the left-hand side, and the new manual, the new Aries manual, you can download it there. It's all in PDF format. You can read it online, or if you'd like to, you can print it on your very printer. Or if you spend some money at Kinko's, they'll print it off, put it in a binder, all those kind of cool things. So there was a lot of work in that manual, and a lot of things have changed in areas functionality and organization. Uh, a lot of old terms that were, didn't apply, a lot of functionality didn't make any sense. Um, a lot of work's been gone to that. I highly encourage you to go do that. Training. All leaders and volunteers. ICS training, the IS 100, 700, 208. Most of these courses take just about two to three hours to sit in front of a laptop to do. Um, now, when you go online to FEMA, you need to get a student ID. Why? Because you, before they used to track you by social security number, and finally the federal government caught up with their own regulation. Uh, it said you can't track people by their social security number, and FEMA said, oh, that include us? And so they made you go get a student ID. Register for your student ID, and they will maintain the transcript. Every little course that you take that's free online they will keep record of. Plus, you'll be able to print down a lovely, lovely certificate that's suitable for framing to hang on your wall there at house. Now, all of these have little letters at the end of them, part A, B, B, whatever. If you go on to our website, which I bet you know what it is, ariesok.org, uh, click on the tab on the left-hand side of the page that says training, scroll down the page, you'll see a direct link to each of those modules that we suggest you go see. And then you can actually download and watch those. EC1, all leaders and key volunteers should do that. That is an ARL course. Uh, you have to pay to attend that course, about 75 bucks. That is a university level course. The 75 bucks does not go to the ARL. They're not making money. That goes to the um, Education Institute that's out there in Connecticut. A uh, community college that actually maintains the website that you're using, and they helped write the curriculum with the ARL. 
they manage all of that. So it's, it's a, an online university course that you can actually go through. It is a good course. There's another one that's an EC16, which is a course with some pre-recommendations. There's a bunch of other ICS courses they suggest you do. There's a couple other ARL courses they suggest you do. Once you complete all of that coursework, then I get to see that you've done all that coursework, then you can go on and actually take a test to uh, get your EC16 uh, certification. Senior leaders, if you're a district emergency coordinator on up, that's generally a good thing that I suggest you do. Uh, you, it's one of those things that you're not going to be able to sit down and run through it and get it in a weekend, unless you're one of those crazy people. Uh, Paul would probably do that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's good information and good training, uh, and that's why we like to have it for all senior leaders. Our image, what do we look like? What do we sound like? Creating a positive image when you're out in public. Jane, everything we do when it comes to Aries is out there in the public. You start with your go kit. A lot of folks know what a day one bag is or a go kit. You know, that first bag you jump, show up at a public service event. Well, the first thing you put in your go kit is you. That is the first thing. My little joke over here, what's in your go kit? I mean, you, you've got to, how we represent ourselves, how we look with each other, how we interact with each other. Do we show up and look like a professional? Are we able to talk and communicate and interact with them professionally? That's an important thing. Deployment vests. When you look around the world out there, if you're not a police officer wearing a uniform, state trooper wearing a hat, right, fireman wearing your little uh, fireman suit, you know, generally if you're somebody else out there, you're wearing a vest. Now, the vests are kind of neat because they go out over things. If you're smart, you buy a vest that's big enough that you can wear it out over your coat in the winter. Don't buy a little tailor-fitted vest that you can only wear in the summer, <coughs> you know. Out over everything. Inside EOCs, inside emergency operation centers, you will start seeing folks wearing vests. Why? It's instant IDs. You can read it across the room versus a little tag like this. You can see who they are, what job function, you know, you know what they're doing and how they're doing it. Look sharp, be sharp. Bike rides, fun runs, training, community events, parades, wear your vest. You know, these two guys may know everything about communications, but these two also look like they need some help. These two guys look like they're here to help. They're prepared to help. Believe it or not, Gail, and I'll pick on you for a second, he's an emergency manager with City of Moore, right? I mean, uh, if folks kind of look like Bubba and Clem and you don't know who they are, what's your first impression? Yeah, see ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. They're really just kind of, they look scary. You know, when you show up at a ham fest and you got 16 handhelds, a backpack, and a helmet with an antenna on it, it's fun. You show up at a club meeting like that and go, look at that, I got my Google Glass in here and I'm doing that. It's all fun. It's geeky. It's ham radio, right? You show up and your local group shows up to help out at a disaster because they've said, we need some communications help, and you guys show up there. You scare the hell out of them. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you show up, you got your day one bag, you know, you're trained, look good, got leadership there, the relationship has already been established, things work out just smooth. Where do you get this snazzy looking vest? Well, there's a couple of places. You can certainly get, get it on the ARL's website, uh, arl.org slash shop. They've got two vests. Don't buy the cheap one. It's cheap for a reason. Anybody that's bought the cheap one just wasted $15. It's crapola. I have begged and begged and begged for them to get rid of it. But they go, well, our vendor thought it would be a good low price alternative. And I went, Burr! get rid of the damn thing. Now, if you got 50 bucks, go to hamthreads.org. That's this vest. This vest is workable. It's got pockets. It's got pockets on the outside. It's got pocket that'll fit a vest. It's got pocket that'll support a notebook. It's got clips for mics on there. It is a real vest. It's sharp. And on the back of it, both of them say amateur radio emergency communications. Now, we got a lot of folks go, why does it say all that? Why doesn't it just say communications? Why doesn't it just say radio? Why doesn't it just say this? 
because under the rules of the road that we operate under, Part 97, we are defined as amateur radio emergency communications. And I'll show you the legalese later and why those words are important. And this is proof of performance that amateur radio is the folks out there providing emergency communications. And when we're out there doing public safety communications, the FCC says we're providing emergency communications. It's their definition, not ours. We didn't make it up. So again, this is just a billboard for who we are. Because uh, there's other folks running around out there with a billboard of what their organization is too. You know, trust me, you walk into a Red Cross function, you ask to use the bathroom, somebody will put a vest on you. <laughs> you know, if you've ever been around, they, they, Salvation Army is the same way. Okay, our approach to public safety communications. What do we do? How do we do it? When you go back and do all that training, you will hear a lot about this. You will hear a lot about that this is incident command. This is the way it all lays out and how everybody plays there. When we're at a big enough incident, when incident command is put together, Aries ends up working for this fellow right here. That fellow there is generally a COML. Again, FEMA with their acronyms. They like acronyms. He is a communications unit leader. That is generally how you work it. Now some things, smaller events at a community level, they really haven't gone full bore into uh, the ICS format. You might be working directly for the emergency manager. But really that emergency manager is wearing the hat of, you know, like a lot of them, he's probably wearing three or four extra hats. But generally you're under the logistics section and you calm out. One of the things you'll see in the training, if it's a big enough event, the first place you're ended up is a rally point for your group and then your group ends up over at staging and that's the first place they sign in and then generally they get deployed through the COML to where they're going to go. But that's how it functions and that training that we talked about earlier makes a lot of this clear and understandable and you'll understand where we are and how we function. Another thing, when we do things, we document everything. Everything we do gets documented. Any team that's out there, whether it be a one person team or there's three of you that are set up to work at a particular place, you're at a shelter, you're logging what you do on an ICS 214. ICS 309, this one is starting to trickle into the world. This is actually a radio log, you know, just like a station log. This is where you log down everything. Uh, FEMA really hasn't recognized it. California's recognized it. Coast Guard likes it. It'll finally probably make its way into FEMA's world. But if you go to this big old long website, or if you go to a shorter website, guess which one? AriesOK.org. You should find all of these forms on our site. And then the other one is an ICS 213. If you are within Aries and you're on an Aries function and you're sending a written message, you're doing it on an ICS-213. Why are we doing that? Especially if we're playing with public safety folks instead of the ARL. Because an ARL form works really good in the NTS thing when you're forwarding messages in multiple hops. When you're in a public safety setting and you're just really sending one message from here to the group across town, Shelter One has contacted you and said they need more food and they tell you, give you a list and you need to take that information and give it to uh, the resource manager so they can get the right food out to that shelter on ICS 213. The other thing that you want to throw in your go bag is carbon paper. I know it's hard to find. Go into Staples, ask for it. They go, what? Then you have to get the old guy with the gray hair and he goes, carbon paper, we still have some. <laughs> because all of these ICS 213s that you'll get are single page. Well, you need to keep a copy of it so when the message comes back, you'll know what you're referring to. Believe it or not, the amateur radio world, yes, I'm one of them, we have put into the FEMA system a new ICS 213 that we're trying to get blessed. Uh, we sat down and did a lot of planning with the Office of Emergency Communications, and it looks surprisingly similar to lessons learned on the ARL form. Yes, it actually has things for like message number, who you gave it to, you know, who you sent it to, who you're getting it back from. So it's got a few extra little blocks really for routing at the end of it. Because the 213 is really good if you're sitting in one room and you're giving it to a guy in another room. And he gives you an answer right back. 
but that's the form that the public safety world uses. And hopefully, last time they did a form change, it took them three years. Uh, we're into year one, so two more years you might see an improvement. But uh, we're, we're trying to get that actually blessed and a change uh, in, in, you know, uh, I think we're going to get it because initially when we showed it to a couple of the folks that um, advise uh, with the Office of Emergency Communications, they went, this is brilliant, and we didn't tell them it was really an amateur radio idea. We don't want them to know because, you know, we want to think it's a government idea. <laughs> but anyway, hopefully it'll come. If not, when your local group is doing a 213, up at the very top hand corner, number them, you know, reference it on your radio log. So when you get answers, you can keep track. On the very bottom, it's a wide margin. Write who you sent it to, who you got it back from, tracking stuff just like you did on an ARL form. Documentation proof of service. If your local group does a public safety event, go on to our website, ariesok.org, and submit a 157, it's a public safety event. All it's really asking is, who was there? Who were the leaders? What resources you used? I.e., what repeater, what frequencies, what you did? How many of you were there? How long were you there? That's it, it's pretty simple. If you're a leader, an emergency coordinator, or a district emergency coordinator, every month, you need to go on there and do a 212. You can find all that on ariesok.org. If you're running a net and you're part of the world, please do a net report at the end of every net. It's really simple. What net, what frequencies you used, where you did, any big subjects you, you handled, and send that to the net manager. You can find her information on ariesok.org. Um, you can just send that to her. You can send it to her in an email, or you can go on and do an ARL message form and submit it in your local NTS uh, traffic net. They love those. Gives them some traffic to handle, other than birthday greetings and your licenses expire and grandma can't find the dog and all the other messages that are pretty benign, you know, because they do that for practice. But submit that to them that way too. But all this can be done on ARL.org, uh, ariesok.org. This is the website, and we've added a few more tabs here. Um, I need to do, a, I tried to do a different screen capture and I couldn't get it to turn into a JPEG on this, so I'm going to have to futz around with it. But anyway, that's the way the website looks like. This banner up here sometimes changes. Uh, if we've got something going on, uh, it can have a notice up there and information. If you're a leader, this is a, go look at it, you know, once a week as a minimum. Uh, you'll see what's on up there. But again, all your stuff you can do over here uh, some of this stuff is open to the public, uh, i.e. the forms, training resources, information like that. Other part of it, you're not going to be able to get it without a login. And to get a login, you just register. It's not a big deal. If you uh, lose your login, all that, contact our webmaster. Roland, the fellow over there that's hiding, uh, Roland Stofa has done a lot of work on the website, so uh, do that. The other thing is you need to go on and get on the Aries Oklahoma Yahoo group. Now we have a button on the website, ariesok.org, that'll actually take you right to here and you can join. Part of the reasons we picked a Yahoo group, because the Yahoo group does not require you to have a Yahoo email address. Unlike Google, Google if you go onto one of their groups, you must have a Gmail address or they don't like you because Google's goal is to take over the world. And they're working on it. Uh, but, you know, anyway, uh, if you do have this long address, go on there and do that, that group. Most of our notices of when an area is on standby or activated are going to go out in this group. Uh, you're also going to get reminders every month about doing monthly reports. Uh, in the middle of the month, there's a, did you lose your login? Or if you haven't updated your information, go on to Aries OK and update that. My favorite thing is to go on to Aries OK to get a hold of a local leader and none of the phone numbers work and his emails don't work. Oh, I changed that. <laughs> Hello? Let us know. You know, we can't get a hold of you. Your local folks can't get a hold of you. 
Now, why do we do this instead of some other high dollar fancy mail server? Because this one cost us zero. So, you know, all those advertising on Yahoo pay for that, and we're fine letting somebody else pay for it. So that, that's one of the reasons we do it. But once you register on ariesok.org, does not automatically get you on the Yahoo. You have to take that second step. So uh, that, that's an important thing. Uh, you know, if you are registered on the Yahoo group and your group has a public safety event coming up, you guys are going to do a public service event, you're going to support a parade or something like that, and you want to post information about we need operators, go for it. You know, if it's in the genre of what we do, go for it. Post it on there. Yes, people all over the state will seal it. Okay, I don't care. You know, use it. People other than just me can post things there. And that's how we do that. If you're an officer or a leader, you really, really, really absolutely need to be on the list. Also, my other favorite thing is I haven't checked my email in about a week. What? This is 2015. You know, check your email daily, you know, especially if you're serious about being involved, check it daily. And if you're a really, really addicted person, you know, if you got a smarty phone, get it set up with your emails forwarded to your smarty phone too. You know, most folks are doing that, some are, some aren't, but more and more folks are doing that, uh, especially if you're in the leadership role. Once a week. We have an actual net that is run by Aries, for Aries, of Aries, and it is on HF. This is a statewide net. Um, we get folks go, why don't we use this or that or the links and systems? Because this requires a person, an antenna, and a radio. And it is generally when all stuff hits the wall, sometimes it's down to those are the tools that you need. Several events over the last several years that uh, my favorite thing, a couple of years ago we had an ice storm that covered from like Pittsburgh County up through um, Muskogee County into Mays County. That part of the world, state did not know that part of the world was that bad. They hadn't heard any reports from them. Well, they hadn't heard any reports because phones, nothing was working. Uh, it was a ham there that got on these two frequencies and started calling in a ham that was outside the area that went, oh, that's pretty bad. And then we in turn called the state resource number at the EOC and said, hey, have you heard anything from Pittsburgh County? And they went, nope, that's because they can't call you. And uh, then resources got shipped and uh, Jimmy Moore, God rest his soul, uh, got help at Muskogee and started sending the cavalry. But it was amateur radio that helped out. Geez, back in 2000, uh, 918 area code, took a nap. Everybody remember that? Little flood in the basement of the AT&T building, and boom. If you were on 918 area code, your phones didn't do a damn thing. They had a dial tone, couldn't call anybody, couldn't call your neighbor, couldn't call 911, nothing was working. And it was the amateur radio. It got the word to the state and got the word to AT&T in Wichita, who went, well, we've been calling, nobody's answering. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what's great. When, the fo when TPD, the Tulsa Police Department, and one of the emergency managers went over and knocked on AT&T's door, they wouldn't open the door. <laughs> they were busy. Really? Don't have time to talk. Yeah. TPD told them, open the door or we're coming in. They opened the door. But anyway, these two frequencies, depending on weather conditions, time of year, things like that, 7260 and 3900, plus or minus QRM, that's ham speak for up or down the band, depending on noise or rude people that are sitting on that frequency. 7260 in the summer months, like right now, you go out there about two, three o'clock in the afternoon, you start hearing some groovy music. You're like, what the heck is that? That's a million watts coming out of Radio Free Mongolia, a shortwave station on 7260 over there in China. A million watts. Holy cow, no wonder you can hear them. You know, but most of the year we don't hear them because they're trying to talk to all of Mongolia. Uh, but anyway, 7260, 3900. Generally, when something goes on, 
we get a big, wide, regional event. Ice storm, big swath of, of rain, something like that that's really causing problems here. You'll see an email maybe a day before, if it's possible, like winter events. We generally know they're coming. You know, you'll see emails and we might throw out watch nets. Watch nets are nets that'll be at pre-programmed scheduled times. They may be like at 6 a.m. in the morning, at noon, 6 p.m. at night, midnight, or if it's busy enough, we may go to a three-hour schedule. It's at 3, 6, 9, 12, and then we'll pick it back up at 6 in the morning, something like that. What those are designed to do is if you happen to be in an affected area where everybody's in the dark, it at least gives you somebody's listening to you. All right? One of the things that is in the works, amateur radio capabilities other than just local UHF, VHF, hopefully will be coming to the state EOC. Uh, we went to a couple of vendors, found a vendor that wants to help uh, do some of the engineering. They have some challenges in the state EOC, i.e. they're in a Cold War era bunker in between two buildings and they're 300 and some odd feet away from their antenna. Uh, they've got a very, very lovely Harris HF station down there that FEMA paid for, paid to run an antenna and all that kind of stuff, put a big antenna on the roof, but it gets to talk to five frequencies, which <laughs> other th None of which we can talk to. Right, none of, none of which state ma emergency managers, you know, when they get on that net and they actually do check-ins, I think you can check in from way out west. Uh, you can't check in, you're too close, you can't hear anybody. Uh, Tulsa can check into them. If some of the air conditioners in and around downtown aren't running, uh, but you know, it's a commercial system. And the other thing, we all know about uh, band fade or frequency fade here as an AM radio operator. You can sit there and sometimes and turn that one little dial, oh, you can hear him better. Well, on a commercial system, you're on that frequency, <laughs> 7260, or, or on there. There are 71 whatever, and they can't wiggle. Well, you and I know, on a hot day like this, look out there. Look at the tops of the cars, right? You see all that heat coming up off there? What do you think the radio frequencies are doing in the atmosphere? Same thing. That lovely Harris radio can't do squat. So they're stuck. So if they're not five over nine, talking to somebody, it doesn't really play well. And by the way, the squelch control on it is really high, so if they're not a strong station, they don't hear them. <laughs> but that's why hopefully we're for sure one radio is going to be there, ideally two. Uh, one will be digital capabilities for written traffic in digital mode, and the other one will be a voice station. And the, the thing is, That'll open up, that'll make it easier to all the state EOCs to be able to play in the shortwave or HF world at a lower dollar point because, did you price out one of those Motorola HF radios that were like $20,000? <laughs> yeah, and then the Yesus out there, and it's pretty, the Yesus, but it's still two grand. Um, but those, those are pretty pricey. But it'll also open it up to when there are areas where, you know, it is amateur radio that's able to transmit information. They'll be able to get information from the field through these two frequencies. And this will be the still the main focus. The other one that we're going to start playing with in and around the state, I'm going to talk a little bit about with our, our, uh, our net control group. And hopefully in the future, we're going to start doing a, a, a 60 megahertz net uh, in there. We're, we're looking for a time slot that other folks aren't doing it. When I lived in Alaska, if you guys know about the, uh, the uh, uh, not 60, 60 meters, 60 meter band, 5 megahertz area, uh, one of the frequencies there is designated as the Alaska emergency frequency. Well, the reason that's been around, that's been around from the civil defense days, but that particular frequency, if you go look at it, if you're up in Alaska, you walk into any public safety agency in Alaska, they are monitoring that frequency 24-7, uh, 365. Every dispatcher up there has got a radio sitting in their, their, their center like that. Um, and, and they've been using it for a bazillion years up there. 
when I was in law enforcement in Alaska, uh, in my office, you know, I had, I had a, a mobile radio for us. We had a marine radio that we could talk to Coast Guard. We had uh, CB radio so we could talk to local drug dealers. And then we had, then we had a, uh, an amateur radio station in there that had been modified for the state net. Why? Because the amateur one was cheaper than the commercial one. But uh, there were times that our community was dark and we were able to talk to Anchorage on the other side of two mountains uh, by using that radio. But uh, that is a radio system that we're going to start uh, playing with. Uh, more, most of the new radios that are probably in the last five years that have come out in HF uh, have that band in them. Radios that are generally older than that uh, don't have it. Uh, but again, more and more equipment's coming out uh, in that particular way. Antenna systems. We're talking about, we only care about Oklahoma. We're being selfish. So an NVIS antenna, or as they call it, a cloud burner, depending on what language you want to put, do the best job for being able to talk to our region. Mostly you'll pick up a little bit of southern Kansas, a little bit of Arkansas, a little bit of northern Texas, sometimes New Mexico, but all of Oklahoma uh, will come up on that net and come up there uh, clearing up. How many folks in here check into that net every week? <laughs> yep, yep, there are four. Uh, you know, it's a good thing to check in. It's a roll call net. Uh, they check into it uh, by roll. That's an old habit. That's just the way they do. Uh, if you've checked in at least three nets, they'll put you on the roll. Um, how the roll goes is it goes alphabetically by the first letter that is past the number identifier in your call sign. Like me, I'm at the end of the list because it's X, uh, but seven and then X, so I'm down towards the bottom of the list. So uh, anyway, it's a roll call net. If you're not on the roll, when they get to the end, they open it up, check ins, just check in there, and then they'll come back for everybody for comments. Um, not a lot of general information moves around this. This is just practice for where the focus point is if stuff's going on. And it's also a good chance to play with your equipment, see how you work. A couple of folks, you know, use this as a tuning net. You know, they figured out the, their antenna, oh, move the antenna, oh, put the antenna on this side of the yard. Hey, okay, you know, that's part of the reason we do it. Okay, if you're registered or if you're not registered, everybody here know where to send their friends? Ariesok.org. Real simple. You want to find training information? Where would you go? AriesOK.org. Oh, gee, you can't remember that big old long Yahoo group address. Where do you think I can find it? Aries. OK. Yeah, people are sharp, I'll tell you. You know, it's a simple process. We tried to make it because when we, when Roland and I first sat down uh, 13 years ago, and there was a cadre of us that were talking, all this information was in 900 places. It was in books here, over here on this website. Somebody had a stack of piece of paper. You know, some of it was on the ARL site. It all wasn't in one place, so we tried to make it a little easier to find. Okay, this is what I talked about, the billboard on the back of the vest. This is an important thing to remember. How many amateurs have an invested interest in public safety communication? All of us. And this is in Part 97. These are the rules of the road. This is why we exist. Now, I want everybody to know, this is the first item. Basic uh, bias and purpose. 97.1 and item A. You know, they've got all sorts of other cool stuff for the goodness of mankind, experimentation to be able to give everybody else a hug on the radio. But the very first thing, the rules and regulations part designed to provide amateur radio service having a fundamental purpose to express in the following principles. Recognition and enhancement of the value of the amateur service to the public, voluntary, non-commercial, Communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. Number one reason we exist. I get folks that want to argue with me over it's a hobby, and it is. Oh, it's just something fun to do. It is. But the number one reason the government has not sold our frequencies to some commercial provider is this item here. Trust me, they would sell it in a heartbeat. I mean, gone. There is a daily fight 
and the folks up the food chain for frequencies. Think about it. How much of your stuff now is wireless? Now multiply that by all the business people out there, all the companies, all the commercial entities to do that. The next big fight is in an area that's called D-Block. And you got public safety world trying to hug that and call that theirs. And you got other folks that want to buy it and do other things with it. And there's a big fight going on in there. Amateur radio has a little portion of that. But so, you know, there, there's, there's fights for frequencies all the time. If you think back in the 90s, middle 90s, uh, the FCC damn near gave away two meters. What? Because Motorola wanted to buy it. Motorola handed them a check. They just give it us. Those guys don't use it much. CB's dead, and the FCC almost bought it. So the number one reason we're out there, and being seen with those vests for your local parade, turning in public safety reports, turning in monthly reports, all that information gets piled in big databases. And trust me, when you walk into Washington and go, here, they go, well, we don't know uh, how much uh, amateur radio emergency services it really does. And here we go, there's a ham in every county in Oklahoma. What? There's 662 of them registered that say they're here to help any one time. Last year they gave this amount of hours. Those hours equate to dollars. This amount of equipment was used. I mean, just the little event that we did in Bridge Creek. You know, they sat there and I gave it to them in hours and dollars and they were like, wow, it was uh, $10,000 worth of volunteer time. That meant that was $10,000 of people they didn't have to go hire. So all of that reporting that you can sit there and go, oh, take me five minutes to do this report, it's all valuable information that gets run up the food chain. And it's all proof of performance. You know, you ever watch one of these TV stations? Right, they have the big storm on Monday. By Tuesday, there's a commercial showing their head guy going, I was there and told you the storm was coming. We saved your day, right? Well, the reason that guy's doing it, that little commercial is called a proof of performance spot. Why? Because one of their requirements in their license is to save the world. They're required to save the world. Now, they can meet that requirement with just running a crawler at the bottom but that doesn't make the av advertisers happy. So every time they go out and do something like that, they run those spots, and any time the FCC says, well, we don't know if you're saving the world, they show them those spots, and they show them the data. And, they, and the big thing, the weather service, not the weather service, weather channel started it, now your local guys are starting to go, they start going, 19 million people will be affected by this. <laughs> right? Because what are they doing? They're turning in with their license renewal going, we saved 19 million people that day. We know that three people in there actually watch their television station. <laughs> but they're turning that data in. And that's why that reporting is so important for us, because we're turning that data in to show that we are fulfilling right there. We're the amateur radio service, because everything the FCC does, they license it as a service. If you're in, a, in an airplane, it's the aviation service, right? If you're on a boat, it's the marine service. They like to use that word. So that's what their word. We're amateur radio, emergency communications. That's what we do. Now, all the other stuff we do to have fun, you know, to sit there and go, you know, I took a thing and I sent it and it went over there and it bounced off that building and went over there and, uh, and my neighbor heard it and his dog barked. You know, all that geeky stuff we do for fun, that's all for fun. That's all the fun part, but this is the reason we exist. So get your friends involved, get trained, get your snazzy little vest. You know, when your local club goes out to do a parade, wear your club hat, wear your club t-shirts, wear those vests when you're out there in public. We want them to be able to see that, that I'll use the U word, uniform, the instant ID, so they go, oh, that's the ham group. They know where they are, trust me. Those guys in Tulsa, there's a whole bunch, they go out for these events and they all got those vests. Look sharp, don't they? Has it changed the attitude of some of the cops that used to stand at the barricades and go, what are you doing? A lot. A lot. It's amazing. 
you got questions, get a hold of me. I am really difficult to get a hold of. Call that phone number, trust me, my wife can tell you, I answer it. Send me an email, n7xyo at arl.net or yahoo.net, there's a card up there. If you forget all this, you can go to the Contact Us tab on what website? AriesOK.org, and you can get a hold of me. If you're one of those Twitter geeks, you can follow me on Twitter, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, you know, if you ask me a question, I will answer you. You may not like the answer, that's okay, <laughs> but I will answer you. And sometimes the answer is, I don't know. You should be talking to somebody else. And I generally will point you in the right direction. But, uh, you know, you call, you ask, I will answer. Uh, may not have an answer for you. JC sent me a note. I went, I don't know. <laughs> but at least you get an email back. I mean, I, I don't leave it in the wind because that's one of my pet peeves. I sent him an email and I don't know if he got it or not. And, and you know, email gets there nowadays. You know, Paul knows. He called me. I'll, I'll call. I'll call back. You leave me a message. I, if, you know, if I'm doing work things, I'll, I'll call you back. Okay. Thanks, folks. Enjoy the ham fest. Anybody got questions? Good. I like that part. <laughs>